Francis, are you the chair? No. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. We we've got it. Yeah. This is part of the network engineering session, right? Yes. So all of these sessions come with a unified theme. And Francis, I think you're responsible for that theme, right? <laughs> but but it's a new format that you've tried this year with the, the shorter talks and then the panels. Yeah, I, I like the format. I think it's worked it's worked pretty well. Um you know, in some ways, uh the old format of longer engineering talks uh, is kind of redundant. Um we all know each other really well. Um we we kind of know what's already happening in the engineering space because we have so many collaborative opportunities and and venues to meet each other and to find out what's going on from an engineering perspective. Um, places like Aponet and AER and ANA and GNA, there are many venues that allow us to come together for simple engineering updates. Um, and, that, and that's been, I think, uh, uh, a testament to the work we've done over the past 10 years uh, of bringing everyone together into these systems. So I think this format of let's discuss sort of the next generation, what comes next uh, is the right approach. In the program, this session didn't have a title. So I think we can kind of make one up now. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming. I think the, the generic title for this session uh, is a discussion on engineering the global research and education network or the GREN. Uh, that might not be the best name for what we're trying to do. Um, but essentially, we're thinking about now that we have these systems, uh, how do we tie them together operationally, um, strategically? Um, if the GREN means anything, to me, it means tying together uh, these collaborative systems that we have. Uh, a lot of our organizations participate in more than one. Um, for, you know, for example, we're in ANA and APONET, uh, SURF is in AER and ANA and vice versa. Um, so th in some sense, this work is already happening. It's just not happening in a coordinated way at the global scale. Uh, it's happening at the regional scale and happening successfully. Um, so we're going to think today a little bit about how do we scale that globally um, and hopefully turn that into a discussion um, with interested uh, parties here. I think we'll start with a little history of uh, the early days of GNA and and the thinking behind these systems um, evolve that into some of the Pathfinder work that's happening that has happened in ANA and is continuing to happen uh, within ANA, and then open up a discussion about how these uh, systems are valuable, what the systems might look like moving forward, uh, how we can evolve them uh, into the next generation. Um, we want it to be a discussion. So we're going to kind of keep it casual, push things back and forth, um, and expect it won't work if there's no input from, from you. So we may uh, be aggressive in our, uh, our, our asks for uh, input. So I think first introductions, Ed Moynihan from Indiana University. My name is Alexander van der Hill. I'm with SURF in the Netherlands, responsible for, uh, for policy and strategy there on the international uh, level. Lars Fischer with uh, Nordinet. I'm doing uh, international relations at Nordinet. Um, Alex Mora from the GNA uh, leadership team and Kaust, um, senior network engineer. And again, I'll say thanks to uh, Francis for letting us uh, have a conversation we've had over dinner here many times <laughs> to bring it out into a, a public forum. Um, so I think first we're going to let Lars talk a little bit about the history of the GNA and sort of how we got to where we are. Uh, we're going on, I think, 12 years uh, since the original documents were put together and 10 years since the white papers were signed and somewhat certified by the community. And it's unbelievable to me, uh, someone who's been around that long, and that it's been 10 years since the white paper documents were signed off on. And you know, a lot has changed. Um, but we haven't really solidified any of that. So, Lars, you have a mic? Yeah, 
did that thing come on? No. Did... Can we sh show the slide from the input? It worked before. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. So that was saying, um, before 2010, we had a lot of global connectivity between the NRENs, and pretty much all of that was done in a bilateral fashion. We had all these different networks who agreed we need an, a link between this particular network in Europe and this particular network in Asia. So there was a Xiang had a link with CSTNet, and one with CERNet, or one with South it and so on but there was no global coordination of how would that work at a, at a how would we bring all that together and how would we make sure that all these links were exploited in the best way and what happens if one of these links break then that those two networks would be responsible themselves for the backup so around there 2012 a bunch of people came together with this vision of the global research and education network and and it's important to understand that isn't a network. Nobody imagined an organization r running this network or this being in a, a single entity driven by someone. It's purely a, a, a drawing of what somebody imagined would exist. Um, and the notions that came about in those early discussions was that we have to build the thing because we have to make a promise to science and to education globally that if you do something in Australia, put up a telescope there, and you want to use the data in Canada, we have to be able to promise these researchers, whatever data you produce there, you can utilize over there, and we will make sure the data can get there. That's the promise all research networks make to their users, to their customers. We take care of your data, you focus on your research. And we have to do that at a global scale and we have to be coordinated and able to do that in a reliable way. Because this thing about networks being down for for a couple of hours because one particular link across the Indian Ocean is broken, we can't have that anymore because it's too important for science. Um, so we have to find a way to federate and join our resources, individual links, still individual links bought by individual networks, but we have to put them together in a pool and make a collaborative system out of that. So that was the vision for the GRIN. And that led to the creation of this global network architecture, which as I described is a bunch of documents that were written in 2012, 2013, and were published at the end of 2013 with this vision of having a few core principles and a rough idea of how we're going to implement it. And the core principles were, as Alexander was saying in the previous session, Let's make sure each continent or each region has a couple of key global exchanges, places where anybody who brings connectivity into that place can bring their links. So Singaren runs one in Singapore. Everybody knows if you want to get to this part of Asia, you can bring your links to Singapore, and then you'll have connectivity to lots of places. If you want to go to Northwestern Europe, you can go to Amsterdam because SurfNet runs the exchange there. Let's make sure there is a couple of those in every region so we're redundant and they're well connected. Francis told us yesterday about an effort to make sure they re the, the uh, global exchanges in this region, Southeast Asia, are well connected so you can bring your connectivity to any of those exchanges and they're interconnected. So, so those were the principles we agreed 10 years ago. That's how we do it. And then between those regions, we will find ways to share capacity among each other as much as possible and to coordinate how to do that. So coordinate between Southeast Asia and Europe to coordinate between Asia and North America, between Asia and Europe, between North America and, and Europe. How are we deploying the links? Who's buying which links? And how do we make sure they complement each other on different cable systems? They're not fragile in any way. So that's what's the vision of how are we going to realize this idea of the global research and education network. And I'd say that we have come a long way. We had this idea we would have a slow start. We didn't quite know how we we're going to implement it, but we were going to launch this thing with a couple of pathfinders, ask a couple of groups of people to try this out. And there was a couple of people who were going to, an organization going to try this out across the North Atlantic, something called ANA. And I hand over to Alexander just a moment. He can talk more about that. Um, but I do think we've come a long way, but at the same time, we have to recognize now that these documents we wrote were written with the thinking of what happened 10 years ago. 
and or more, they were published 10 years ago. Um, and the people who were part of writing those documents are, to some extent, no, not around anymore. Well, time passes and some of us are getting closer to retirement, Francis. <laughs> Uh, and some of these people have already retired, and some people have left the community. And, and so some of this understanding of how are we getting to implementing this, and once we have parts of an implementation, what happens then? How do we operate this thing? There wasn't any really clear idea back then, and nobody has really picked up on further developing that idea of what Edwards was talking about, how are we actually going to implement it? So that's where we are right now. We have this vision, and we've made really good strides at buying the links that realize that vision. That's where we are right now. We have the links, we have the open exchanges, but all the rest of the pieces, maybe not so much. So my question really for this room is, what do we do next? How are you going to contribute to taking the next step of realizing that vision so that we really get a global research and education network that is reliable, operated in a in a way science can depend on? So, so because that's the question here today, though, that's what we really want to discuss with you. But before we do that, maybe Alexander, you can talk a little bit about one of the past. I think I have some ideas about those uh, those next steps here. But as you say, uh, I think, yeah, we, we invested heavily over the last 10 years in those systems. Uh, we started, I think, 10 years ago uh, with, with, with ANA. Uh, parties around that table uh, now look carefully at the capacity that they uh, they buy. We make sure that we're not on the same cable uh, systems. Um, and we do that in AER uh, uh, as well. And that's indeed a huge, huge different compa difference compared to uh, what we did before that. I uh, recall the the time at Surf that we just bought our own links to connect into uh, Internet to War, for uh, for example. Yeah. And so did Nordinet, uh, and so did all of us. So uh, uh, on, on the niche, niche of the stick side, I think Konishi san made a major impact <laughs> because he he created a niche of the stick ring. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that enables it. And, and yeah. I think uh, Super that, important. there was a, ma a major step forward. Mm -hmm. Because prior to that, it was a, a very distinct and okay, I, I I'll help you, you know. Yeah. But with the Asian Pacific Ring, which is now called AvoNet, because it's, mm -hmm. it's become a lot more yeah. Yeah. different from a, yeah. a ring, a yeah. lot yeah. more fasty. Yeah. And, and it also taught us how to better work together with each other. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. Right, we have learned a lot, both about how buying these links and and orchestrating these things together. But we have also formed the relationships that allow us to do this because we know how to work together between Asia and Europe, between Europe and North America. And the trust. We have the trust now, and I think maybe that trust is what was needed to develop before we are ready to take the next step of coordinating our operation and doing all the stuff we talk about in the AER engineering group and and so on. Right. So, so I think. We have done a lot. And I heard Ed uh, talking about the momentum uh, earlier today. And I think he's right uh, with uh, with that at, uh, at the moment. Uh, of course, we are all focusing on extra bandwidth across those uh, systems. We're looking into buying capacity or a spectrum uh, kind of things there. But we also fully believe that we need to make a next, next step in uh, operations on the on the network, better coordinate what we do. That the, that the network, the systems that we build, like AER or like uh, ANA, that has a predictable behavior. And everybody, all of you here in the room, uh, need to take your role in uh, in that. Uh, and I'd like to see to improve that a bit more over the coming uh, times. So we'll show you when you ask me for a goal for the next coming. Ten years, then that that that's gone. Uh, last uh, the, the coming few years, uh, we must do that. Uh, uh, I would say, I would say, um, yeah. Uh, and those systems, those systems really act as a system. We all contribute a link into the system, but in return for that, uh, you get uh, services or capacity or capabilities over the full system. So that means when uh, uh, NII, uh, for example, contributes a link from Amsterdam to Tokyo uh, into the system. They also get uh, uh, capacity or capabilities on the link from the coast guys from Singapore to uh, to Amsterdam. And we need to we need to realize that that it should work in that way. It's not the engineer uh, from from Japan that's working on uh, on his own link because also uh, rights on the system uh, on the, on the other bits and pieces there. And we need to organize ourselves to uh, to, to to really make that uh, happen and, uh, and predictable. Yeah. No, I agree, and 
you know, within these systems, uh, everyone contributes a link and they we join meetings and and offer input. Um, but to really make these successful, um, it, it takes a, a a real resource contribution. Um, our engineers aren't going to um, just do the work. Um, there's no carrot to put in front of them um, unless it comes from leadership. Um, and, and my experience um, working within some of these uh, engineering working groups of the systems is you have to, it has to become integrated into the engineer's day job um, because um, it's not, it's not a, an effort that's just going to take care of itself. Um, it has to be very deliberate uh, and the actions and deliverables have to be defined at the global level by leadership. Um, and that's starting to happen with within ANA, um, starting to define um, the, the deliverables for the engineering group. And I, do you want to talk a little bit about what those are and about how they're serving as a pathfinder for some of the, uh, could potentially serve as a pathfinder for some of the other systems? Uh, I think, yeah. Yeah, so we, we really, and we agreed upon that the, the CEOs involved uh, in the in the ANA group that we continue uh, to be a pathfinder for the for the DREN. So uh, the procedures, the documentation, all the things that we develop in ANA, we will try uh, and at least put an effort in to copy that to other parts of the world so that we advance the DREN uh, there. But as Ed uh, said rightfully, uh, we, we, we need truly your help uh, with that. It's not just at leading the engineering uh, group and it happens by magic. Uh, we all need to realize that we're working in those systems here and that aligning our procedures are, are really important uh, there. That we use the same identifiers, uh, the same procedures that we understand that we have backups uh, in place, for example. But... And, and in the same time, there's a lot of work going on in the GNAG. Right, with working groups that are looking at particular technologies, particular areas. So, so I don't know, Alex, you, you can talk to some of that work, how that relates to coordinating and orchestrating a, a global research education network. Yeah, so the GNAG working groups, they have um, many different aspects in terms of uh, the um, research and development. And um, for example, in the data intensive um, science, uh, working group they they the team develops t new technologies new new um, applications that can control and orchestrate the network uh, in an automated fashion so those are aimed to be uh, covering since the the, um, the core of the network until the last mile and the endpoints so you could have a complete automated way to connect two servers, for example, uh, two DTNs in different science DMZs uh, in an automated fashion through a, a circuit to a, to a, a VLAN, for example. Um, and we have the uh, working group on network automation and network orchestration that also works on other levels of automations. And then uh, those are groups that are uh, delivering new technologies and new solutions that can be um, used and, and we hope they are going to be uh, used as a production service. For now, uh, we see there are a lot of uh, work still to be done on, those fr on that front, but we have um, the layer of the test beds working on, with those solutions in many places. For example, like the, the P4 test bed that's running cur currently. Um, and also, um, we have some 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 specific nodes running in a production fashion, running the, with those technologies, despite they are very new and and um, um, not widely used yet. They are working for those uh, for those um, RANs, and uh, we see that this is the, the the desire and the wish that we all start to have those kind of solutions uh, working seamlessly between all uh, domains so we can have those advanced services delivered to the uh, users and researchers on, on the edges of the networks. So those are the, the um, some examples. Um, there are more working groups working on, on, on delivering new technologies and developing new code and, and stuff, but um, 
we we see that uh, these are advancements that are delivering uh, real, um, let's say, um, value to the the GRAM as a whole and differentiates uh, this this community from the commercial providers, for example, because we are relying on the people on all the different RANs to to join hands and work together in solutions like the uh, persona or the um, solutions deployed in the science, science DMZs and the TMs. So those are, are, are um, technologies that are being um, created in these working groups that we see um, re in real use cases and uh, they are delivering real value for the for the GRN as a whole. So what we need now is better coordination on applying those kind of technologies and, and coordination in the network operation side of the service, advanced services. So we, despite we have many of the, the deployments around, we don't have uh, the strong integration between different uh, operations teams yet that's uh, what we want to uh, have more mature uh, in the next years but we need more people involved we need more rands involved we need more engineering teams involved and developers as well and also we need more minds uh, applying their knowledge uh, to solve other problems that are still open so we can uh, uh, distribute, uh, disseminate this knowledge throughout every RAN and, and through the GRAN. Thank you, Alex. I, I also want to put a little bit of a critical note on that because we, we are a community here that likes new things. We like, to, we like to try out things. We like to build things. Operations-wise, we need to be put more effort in that, uh, yeah. I think. And we need to realize that. We play a really important uh, role for those big and small uh, science projects all over the planet. We position ourselves towards those uh, projects to, to secure funding, to make them uh, give us money, our governments and those projects to to to, to build the GRAN. So we need to do a good job in, uh, in this. And for me, uh, somebody who plays a very uh, big uh, example role sits there in the back of the room. She's hiding, I think, Brenna. Um, she's putting really a lot of effort in to bring the people together and to jointly uh, improve uh, the GRAN. And I'd like, I'd like people to join her doing that. Uh, also operations-wise, uh, I think, to develop those uh, procedures and this documentation and to really implement that uh, to, to start within those systems, within AER, within ANA, and from that point also to the to the GRAN uh, level, I would. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think they. I mean, we also heard some talks earlier today mm. about some of these really, really interesting and advanced applications or, or network engineering solutions that have been developed, like the Global P4 Lab and all other all of that that are supporting particular science applications that are really important to advancing the state of what we can do. And we we need to come together there and, and do that jointly because we don't have that many resources to compete with the Google of the world. Um, but at the same time, I think we have realized that was in the ANA, for example, that we also need to put some attention into developing common processes, common procedures, and really basic tools to have make sure we have insight into what the network is doing, what the utilization of the various links are, and and understandings of if one links go down, how do you move traffic to another link? How, how what are we doing there? How making sure those links aren't full when we do it? Um, and I think Francis again, you showed this link in 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 the signing ce ceremony uh, yesterday. You had this one slide where you had the AER, the Aponet, and and the East Asia backbone. Um, those are three separate systems composed of many links. All those three systems have multiple entrants involved, multiple knocks, multiple people from different organizations operating stuff. And I think one of the things we've come to realize over the last 10 years is that we shouldn't underestimate how difficult it is to operate these interregional or intercontinental systems with different organizations involved in doing that. And I think now that we have established those systems, I think we're realizing that the next step is helping the people who jointly are operating these things. I mean, Simon is sitting there in the back of the room mm -hmm. and, and, and can testify 
how difficult it is to operate the RER ER when you are in one of the organization than the guys six time zones away in another NREN where they have different priorities and not responding to your requests. Right? So, and, and with simple challenges like understanding what is the traffic like in their end, what is going on in their end, because you don't have the insight because their tools to look at the traffic on their router is internal behind some firewalls. The only people are employed by Norginet can see it. And then you have to call a guy who's, uh, again, five time zones away, so he's uh, at home or, or un unhappy to be disturbed, or his boss have given him other priorities and all these kind of things. I know it sounds very mundane, but it's actually very important that Absolutely. we fix those problems. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so in addition to doing the advanced networking solutions for science applications, we as operators need, need to focus in order that this very, very impressive infrastructure we've built is stable, need to focus on building the tools to keep it stable and keep it advanced. Right? Sure. Oh. Yeah. 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 yeah, please. Yeah. This is open open discussion. So yes, so the uh, so I'm I am speaking like the uh, not affiliated to the NIOS anything, but the uh, in somehow the I'm joining the all the uh, partnership. So the uh, I'm joining the uh, AR, NA, Eponet, and the new thing. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so the uh, I already seen the gap between those partnerships. So the uh, NA is kind of strong partnership you know, higher level, but the, uh, you know, in Asia, so just starting up in some sense. So, so the, uh, I have actually the, uh, made a document of the operations in the uh, like last month or maybe it's the brand over there. So the, uh, I kind of, that's kind of the, a uh, little bit weird. So the, uh, if I make certified the NA, then the, it's maybe hard for the APO in a way. So the, uh, so, we so the uh, in terms of going to the GRM in the next what's the next step? So then we have to maybe we have to be careful or they are not uh going to the not the normal East Asia, but the Eastern world, the Western world, or something like that. So the uh, of course we got the uh, Chinese people over there. So the uh, we should be more collaborative and also the uh, us is round. So the uh, I I had to get up early in the rain now or something like that. <laughs> So the yeah, those side of things that yeah, that yeah, very agreeable was me. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I'm Kazunori Konishi, who worked for GNA in all days together with Jim Williams and and uh, Arik Jan Boss. And uh, and uh, my uh, request to this meeting is you no, know, I would like to get um meeting minutes because my English capability is limited and uh, I forget everything I get all. That's why meeting minutes, who will write a meeting minutes here? Please decide that first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm sure we can uh, write something of the impressions of the, this meeting to uh, to make you memorize that, Kunishi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kunishi-san. That is, that is very important. Um, no, but I, I'd like to, that thing you said about being part of several of these networks at the same time, right? It's not like we have thousands of people doing this work, right? And that's another reason that would, if if the ANA is developing certain tools, um, we should really collaborate all of us about that because if the ANA develops some tools and the AER develops some tools and they're not the same tools and they work in very different ways, I have some engineers at home who will be very unhappy because they, they have the same five people who have to operate those things in different ways. And that's just a mess, right? So so if we can coordinate, that's really the request here. Can we come together? Can we help each other develop these things to the next level so that when Ed's group and ANA is doing something, everybody pitches in and, and learns from that and gives some input so we can all lift it to the next level? Yeah, I think that's the core of what we're talking about here is there are a lot of different groups that have signed essentially the same MOU. You know, the, the core MOU is pretty much the same across all of these systems. And a lot of times it's the same people with the same challenges uh, and no venue to work together at a global scale. So, so the question I'm asking is, how do we scale that up 
so that we're not all just repeating the same efforts and banging our heads against the wall. Is it a good idea? You know, there's very practical challenges, like Sato san said, you know, time zones are hard, but we've we figured that out before. Uh, and I think we can figure it out here. Uh, the question is, what is it practically are we going to do? Um, and I don't think it's rocket science. You know, I, I think what's being done in ANA now is simply defining what tools can be used to make a sort of common uh, view of the system valuable to, to the group. You know, and, and sometimes that means simply sharing the names and contact information of the engineer that you need to reach out to if there's a problem. You know, I, I couldn't, where do you go for, I mean, I, Aponet probably has a, a, a document somewhere that has these contacts. Who's updating that? You know, is, is, it, is there a procedure, an operational procedure for doing simple things within these systems? My, my answer to that would be not yet. And why should we define all of those at a regional level uh, when we could be defining uh, those things at a, at a global level? Or it's, the same, it's essentially the same people doing the work. Uh, so I think I'd start with that. And yeah, maybe let's go back to the audience and then we can go into the details of what that means. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, I guess the, the whole idea is not to duplicate each other work uh, because we are actually quite strong, short, very tightly strung out, you know, with our resource. You know, we don't have a lot of uh, resource to us. But I, I think the GNA map was one step forward. If that can come up, that would show um, the utilization of our GNA links around the world. And if anything, any links go down, that then we will know about it. You know, so as a network engineer, hey, something is wrong. Let me try and find where, where it's wrong or it, it flags out. Uh, that the place where it's having a lot of problem, um, at least at that level where there's cable breaks and all those which is happening. I mean, the C C U S link was one example. The um, KIST link was uh, another example of it. We we need to uh, capture that and share that information with other engineers because the engine the users of that link can come from all over the world. And, and and the 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 end user may call on their local uh support. We say, hey, what's happening? And the local support have to search around what, what's going on. And if that GNA map uh, is is there, then they can say, okay, what's what's going? Where are you trying to connect to? Then they can look uh, along along that path. But that's a very simple tool. I I think there's uh more detailed tools we can look at the route and and all those things here. I I think there's a very good point there. Because that that map is also about messaging to the outside world, right? One of the things we've seen in the past is that particular big science projects that are being built, like the SKA, who's building a large instrument in Australia and a large instrument in South Africa, when they were started, they were imagining procuring their own private link for their instrument from Australia to Europe or from South Africa to Europe. And what the GNA map shows is there is already an integrated system doing all that. Sure, if you're going to use 20% of the total capacity and all that, we're probably going to ask you for a little bit of money from your research project to run on that. But we can promise you that if you make a contribution to that, you're not just getting your one link you're paid for. You're getting this resilient system across the world so your data could go everywhere. So it's also about messaging and about our promise to these big research projects. So I think that's a very good start. And and again, we need to update that map, map anyway, because the map I showed before didn't at all show this idea of having various regional or inter-regional networks that are doing the, those connections. So the world has changed. We've, we've actually done a lot of innovation in how we do the intercontinental networking. So we need to update that anyway. So, so that that is one, one thing we can do. I fully agree that that is a, a great way of selling what we do to the outside world. It's also a great way to show all the people, all the, all the engineers in the in the room uh, and at home uh, what we're trying to do. But when you, and that again is a bit of a crit critical note from my side, uh, but, but, but when you 
when you your ambition is to synchronize everything, it feels a bit like boiling the ocean. Um, so I think we could focus on implementing new procedures, documentation and stuff within those systems and then tie them together. And then Alex's group in the GNAG, I think is perfect to share uh, information and experience for that, but get it running at first within the system. That's that's complicated enough uh, already. Yeah. yeah. So I think so, I will so, go and so, 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 so Alex, Alex and I are, are Europeans. Um, and have that very European experience of, of trying to do things in a way where everybody is along and everybody is in sync and we everybody agrees to do the same thing in every country. And and what that often does is it prevents anybody from moving anywhere, right? So we have to find a way where we can do what it what is talking about, what is coordinating and reusing things across multiple of these interregional networks, but still do it in a way where those who want us to move and be innovative can do that and move forward. Because if we try to make some imaginary body that insists on coordination and synchronization of everything across the globe, the only thing that will do is it, it'll freeze the world, right? And, no, and no, nothing will move at all, right? So we have to find that balance. Mm, uh, well, I was thinking a number of, of um, items uh, that can be good outcomes of having a global effort. Um, clearly, there is the aspect that is most related with the procurement and capacity planning, which is as its own complication, and we know very well about that. You know, we know what what how long took, for example, for the CA one, you know, project to to really you know come to full uh, fruition, and you know the amount of overhead and work and lawyers and you know and and you know you name it. Uh, but I think there are a couple of things that can really be. I won't call it low hanging fruit because yeah, they are low, but even, even very high. But uh, uh, for example, let's imagine a situation where uh, echoing what Edward was saying, uh, we want to establish um, services across multiple domains. Even that, which you know could seem like a small thing, but let's imagine how beneficial it could be if we have like a set of procedure without imagining any, you know, exotic SDN system, but even something that, for example, allow us to see three or four VLANs over three or four domains in a quick way. Let's imagine how great that would be just to make it work. As I've said, again, without, you know, putting over new system or like bizarre uh, software, you know, that nobody will maintain or, you know, someone will maintain and then it will leave for another work and then it will die. Something that, you know, can be done in a, in, in an easy way, compatible with the existing system that people already have. Because, you know, Klaus was saying something that is very true. The the link, the limit between consensus, consensus building and uh, and um, uptake, it, it's quite it's quite a complicated one to get. Yeah, that's a great comment, Enzo. In fact, some of the work within ANA is um, to document existing VLANs across the system. Uh, it's laborious, uh, and right now it's manual. Uh, could be automated in, in the future. Um, but the value of that is, um, for example, um, I, I believe there was a peering to Internet 2 that went down. There was a, a fiber cut somewhere. Uh, and nobody knew that there was no coordinated backup in place for that. So the peering went down and, and there's no more connection for that peer. Um, if the ANA had known had a, uh, that there was only one VLAN connection for that NREN, it could have been addressed in advance. Um, but each NREN is simply, each engineer is simply responsible for the VLAN on their portion of the system. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is gather all those VLANs, match them, analyze them, and understand what need what holes need to be plugged in, if you will. Um, and it's it, it's been a difficult process, and we're not quite there yet. Um, but that's the type of project um, that we need help on input on. You know, how do we do it best? Um, you know, is there a standard way that we can document VLANs across each of the systems? And potentially just a best practice of some sort for doing that. Um, and then technical improvements that can be defined on top of that. Um, but but certainly VLAN identification, documentation, and analysis um, is part of what the ANA is trying to do. Yeah. Um, 
I was so I've been thinking about this a lot as we've throughout the days of the past two days about collaboration and something I think we're we're missing or th I, we need to think about a little bit more is we have these platforms. So we have these procedural documents and ANA, APONET, et cetera, that in my two years as a brand, as a relatively new engineer in the GREN, I just figured out existed. <laughs> I mean, I, the a second problem is there are, we have measuring and monitoring tools for ANA and for APONET that I'm not sure anybody uses, except me, um, to to tr troubleshoot anything. And so I think we're, there's also a missing connection between buy-in from our, our, as an engineer, our leadership to actually use these tools. You know, we can create a lot of tools and we can create all these procedural documentations, but if there's no connection and then there's no allowance from leadership and from your governing body or whoever that is to actually use these tools and any pressure to actually learn about them and and learn how to use them, how to troubleshoot with them, what the value is of them. They just end up, like what Lars said, they just end up documents that were made 10 years ago that are actually pretty good. I read through them recently and thought, well, this is actually useful. This would have been helpful two years ago when I started this job. And so I think there need, I don't know how to do it, but there needs to be a better education, a better connection between what the policymakers are deciding and what they see as value in terms and, and educating the actual engineers that it, it, it exists, it's usable and how to use it and, and why it's valuable. So um, just another perspective. Yeah, it, it's a really useful point there, right? It's about, it's not just about developing new stuff. It's also about making sure we understand what we have and that that at least that people have access to it. Maybe it's just about having the links to that monitoring system by APONET. It's not about delivering, building something fantastic new. And I absolutely agree before we did this session. I also read those documents again and, and the documents that Konishisan and, 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 and others wrote back then are really, really good. They're very carefully crafted, describing the vision and, and the ideas for how to create a global network that is federated, right? So so I think that is really good. I also, uh, to, uh, Alexander, you were saying before, right? When we think about what we want to do, I think we do, do want to address the low-hanging fruits. We do want to ask the people who are actually doing the operations like Simon, what is it that would be very useful to you that we can can address the, the operational issues? Because there is this fear that we create yet another Mika project that will try to boil the ocean and do something very fantastic. Because there's this quote that, you know, when since we're in this Imperial British Hotel, it's attributed to Winston Churchill. That's one of the sources often given for that. That that the humans tend to un oh, under overestimate how much we can do in a year. And that is always dangerous that we think we can do so much until next year. But also we tend to dramatically underestimate how much we can do in 10 years. And if we mm -hmm. start slow, we can really get a long way if we just allow time to roll. a &A or, or, and and AER and the whole grand development is an example of that. We have gotten very far in 10 years, even though it seems like we every year didn't get very far and only addressed the low-hanging fruit. So I think that is very important if we can understand what is the small next step where we can gradually get to the next level. If we can understand from operations engineers, what is that? Then that will be really, really helpful. And I didn't make a note that one of the, th the things we can do is make management actually insist that this is something we're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. And those documents are indeed great, I think. But we must also realize that those documents are not a goal in itself. Uh, we need those documents to implement uh, the procedures and the documentation and everything within our NOx. And we need to keep, take care of that, uh, I think. Uh, on, my, on my right side, I see that uh, Simon is also willing to share some information. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so definitely I agree with what, what's been said. Um, it's there. There is definitely some difficulties sometimes, especially on maybe on the engineering working group level, and then we go into the operation side of things. Um, there is times when, um, let's say, there's a, a cable break that happens, and maybe not, let's say not all the partners know about it. Um, only a few do. So there's, um, I think, being able to communicate um, with everyone is is a, is difficult. It's a difficult task, but. Um, it, it provides the visibility that everyone needs. Um, I think also 
I was going to, um, I'll get back to me soon. Um, I think it'll come back to me. Uh, give me a two minutes and I'll, right, I'll, yeah. I'll get back. Okay. Yeah. I think what you're saying is quite right. It's very, very hard to align all those uh, people. So we'll start with defining a common language, I think. So once you have a certain level, that make it easier to, uh, to achieve those things. Oh, I, I remember now. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, another thing is, yes, the communication is good, but also from the operation standpoint, they may not understand the, the likes of the AER or the APO net or what kind of paths are being taken in place. So then you get um, emails coming, pinging back and forth saying, um, okay, we, we think it's not going here. We think it's going this way. And having kind of, um, well, documentation for sure, updated documentation and being able to determine where the paths are actually being taken um, will basically make everyone's life easier. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I take the one, this one a bit to me as well because we have been talking about that in ANR, AER, ANA, sorry, uh, working group, and we figured it out that nobody, there are some different understandings of what the system actually means. So there's work all the way uh, in ANA to to really describe in, in a one or two pager what it actually means to have a system like uh, ANA, and the same goes for AER, of course. And I hope that helps. If I may uh, just comment on the, the older documents and the efforts to create new ones, just keep in mind that those original GNA documents were written by a very small subset of our community. You know, and input was only received from a small number of people. Uh, and I think one of the values that we're searching for here um, in opening all of this up to at a global scale uh, is to get greater input um, from all of the different systems, all of the different engineers, the different Brenda mentioned policymakers. Um, who are these people? You know, are they a few leaders in ANA? You know, are they? It's uh, part of scaling up opens those documents up to input from a, a larger set of people in the community. And I think that's a that's a real uh, benefit to trying to pursue this. Alex, do you want to? So um, is it, as this is an open discussion, um, I would like to, to ask the audience um, a few open questions that you may have some answers right now or not, but may be food for thought. Uh, for example, what um, do you have any suggestion for improvement in, in the operation side in terms of uh, some sort of problem or difficulty you are currently facing among yourselves, among your partner, or is there any kind of um, suggestion for a new solution that we haven't uh, deployed yet that could help make your life easier? Um, if there is any any kind of thing on those lines that can bring up um, some input for us would be very helpful. Another idea is to ask you um, what kind of um, new projects, new science projects that are uh, in, on the horizon that may be bringing new challenges, new um, requirements for your network or, um, or your services that you may uh, need assistance or you need to integrate with other the the other partners and the GRAN as a whole. If there is any case, we would like to know about it. So th those are kind of questions that I think we can uh, think about and bring us the um, challenges on the demands and also for the operations. So we can think on um, what kind of steps we, we should take to, to make things better. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And also to that, to think about adoption, because again, what was said about actually having people using various monitoring systems deployed on different things, very often it's a matter of, in my organization, we use Persona and that thing on Aponet has been on NetSage and I don't do NetSage and I don't understand that that's not something we do, so I'm not looking at it. Um, so what is it we need to do to overcome those resistances and and get to adoption. Um, it may seem like a very small thing, but in Europe, 
years ago when we started doing this work, getting adoption of the idea of doing open exchanges was not trivial. There were lots of resistance. And it turned out that one of the things that caused the resistance was that we called them initially glyph open light pass exchanges because that's the way the idea originated back 20 years ago. And so when we call them goals, but um, this G was his word for glyph, then there were some of the European networks who were saying, oh, but we are not members of glyph, we are not doing that. And so the big engineering feed it took to make, get to adoption was to change the name, right? So we call them global exchanges instead of glyph exchanges, right? And then suddenly Europe got to adoption of that. And now Xiang is fully committed to using open exchanges to all the places in the world where we land connectivity. It's a European mission. We seem like we're something we are preaching now. We have more or less forgotten that we thought about it like Matt 10 years ago. Right? Um, so, so sometimes there's these little cultural hacking things that are needed to actually get to that adoption. And so, so thinking about that on the operation side also, I think, would be very, very useful. Sometimes it's not a huge development of a platform that is needed. It's some little trick to get people on board and actually accept that this other tool is also useful. Maybe look at the Apunet traffic graphs once in a while, even though it's NetSage, or we call it something else. Right? Yeah. Very nice, Lars. You, you, you mentioned uh, the different tools that are used. Uh, Alex asked uh, the room uh, what ideas that you have uh, uh, to improve things. Um, some of you might know that we at Surf are quite a bit modest, but uh, well ahead with operation of with uh, automation and orchestration in our network. So when you ask me for an ID, uh, then everybody here in the room should use that uh, that engine, of course. But, but I know that's not going to work. Uh, so all of us have things like that, that we want to see our own uh, tools and, uh, and, 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 and and things that we have to manage this, these systems, those ANAs and those AERs and the GRAN. But of course, that's not going to work. We all need to bend a little bit into those uh, collaborations here. And I, I, the, things that I want, I, the thing that I want to ask to the room is also to, to help supporting that. Uh, when somebody says, hey, I have an ID, go with that instead of uh, say, I'm not going to do that, but it doesn't fit with me uh, here. So think in those uh, global benefits, think of those regional benefits uh, for that. Yeah. And, and that's back to what Brenda was saying before about management attention, right? Because that is one of the things that is needed, that management step in. All right, guys, we well, know we all have our favorite tool. Let's try this thing that is coming out of Aponet and, and actually try to use that all of us just for a little bit and see if that works, right? Mm -hmm. Just wondering what the basic, basic, basic tools that are currently being, being used by uh, the different different knocks that, that we have here, um, you know, um, that the pop in, in Singapore, we use some of the tools. Jian, do you have some common tools? So uh, I think maybe we say, what are the common tools that, that we are using? And, and then uh, um, what with our common tools, what is still lacking for us to help us operate uh, beyond our domain? You know, um, I think persona is there. That's what sh that that's correct, right, Simon? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a management. I'm not, <laughs> no, I'm not an operator. <laughs> uh, but I, I think you know, maybe um, I think in the initial case when we do the AER. We were talking to Keith, you know, what were the common tools that we want? And one of the issues was the VLANs, trying to coordinate the VLANs across and make it easier. And, and so Simon was using, what tool were you using? Netbox. Yeah, he was using Netbox. And then after he did it, and then he shared it with Keith, and I said, yeah, that's a nice tool to, to, to have. You know, um, sometimes you need some, um, someone to start first. And then show the rest, hey, guess what? We we solved uh you know this uh, tedious problem of saying, hey, what VLAN number can I use? What VLAN number can I use? But um with that, then people can quickly look at it. And people on in the netbox, we also put up who which links or uh, which segments of links are our backup for each organization. Am I right, Simon? Sorry, I, I have to always check when my boss said. Because he, he's the he, he's a he's a technical person, and and I, I I'm not I'm just at a high level. But that was very useful, so that people 
And the people that input the information are the, the engineers themselves from a different side. So we, we can capture all those information and they 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 have to keep it up to date. Yeah. Otherwise, that is useless already. Yeah. It's been a while since I, uh, I configured the box, but I fully believe that when you have this information in place, the understanding of the system uh, improves significantly. Uh, and that also helps uh, problem solving. It also helps bringing up, popping up new ideas uh, here. So these things are really important. So you asked about tools, um, potentially at the sake of uh, boring everyone in here. Um, I have a list of the tools uh, and and uh, yeah, common tools that the ANA have sort of identified as being useful as part of the system. And I'll just I'll just read through some of them. I mean, uh, link utilization, general link utilization. We talked about maps, lists of partners and links contributed. Knock phone numbers and email address, up down status, outage notifications, SNMP, VLAN documentation, uh, operational doc process documents, um, potential for personar nodes, with the you know with the realization that that takes a lot of work to to maintain, um, network dashboards, uh, potential for flow data, router proxy. And these are just lists that all of the engineers over the course of a few months within ANA defined as necessary, essential tools to maintain the system in the way that they envision. Um, and and this, this is a growing list. Um, precisely what tools will be used hasn't been defined yet. But this is just a simple exercise of what are the things that we need? And none of this is <laughs> controversial, right? It's just, it's just a matter of getting them all in one place on a wiki. You know, that it's password protected, that the engineers can go in and have access to all of this data so that they understand the system. Uh, and, and doing something like that, you know, within each system, whatever is best for each system, so that there's some sort of operational standardization, uh, I think is useful here. Yeah. Is there a So it's us. Adds... From my point of view, so the, those kind of risks, those kind of risks should be distributed to the, each partnership so that the uh, uh, AR for the VLAN assignment can be the uh, netbox. But yeah, in Aponet, it's be uh, just Google specific or something like that. <laughs> and the, uh, you know, the uh, Grafana in the uh, it's called Brian. And the uh, looking glass in the internet is it's called the uh, Inside Console. So the, uh, there's a, it should, there should be some kind of risk that the, uh, you, if you want to have a uh, looking glass in the internet, it is called the inside console or something like that. So those kind of the uh, rings should be very useful for the operation view. So the, uh, so we, we forget, right? <laughs> Usually forget so what was the name of this, so the Google something like the one or what to, so the, oh, there was, or something like that. So the, those should, some kind of things should be happen. So that we could make a risk, so that maybe from GNA or something like that, so that uh, you could just make a risk. So the uh, and uh, this one goes to something like that, this three, this ring or something like that, so that that would be uh, very useful for all of us. Like the uh, you know, the uh, starting and ring can deploy those sort of things. So that maybe I could do something like that, so that we could build a or maybe Kafka or we need to supersede. So that's fine. So the, uh, I guess. And, and so those are the tools, but shifting to sort of the why, what's the value of doing this? Um, you know, uh, uh, Aponet, for example, um, is, a, is a system of links that were, for the most part, independently procured or contributed. Um, I can envision, you know, five, let's say five years, 10 years from now, where with these oper new operational capabilities, um, you know, it allowing decision makers to look at, you know, using link utilization and other tools, um, future capacity needs and basing future procurements on some of the data and analysis that comes out of these uh, standardized procedures. Um, so, so I think we can start to, to identify the real benefit of doing this. 
um, you know, capacity planning, driving innovation and technical improvements within the system. We already mentioned automation, uh, but test bed activities, for example. Um, it, it's not just to keep the system up and running. Uh, it's to define uh, and improve and make more efficient future engineering investments uh, and endeavors. I don't know if anybody wants to comment. Yeah, absolutely. But and 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 also for the big science projects, of course. Um, when we look around, we see now that sometimes big science projects want to uh, procure their own links. For example, I think what we do and when we do that, we do, we're doing this well. We can improve this when we do really well. We can get uh, those projects to invest in us, so we can improve the common layer for uh, science projects here, so that we can all benefit from uh, from that. And that's for me one of the big things why we do this we will build a common infrastructure for education for science projects big and small that all benefit from this uh, this great infrastructure this year yeah yeah so, so we know that we're going in a couple of years to have the ska in australia coming online with flows of 100 maybe 200 gigs towards europe and australia we need to be able to project how much capacity we're going to need can we actually take that traffic if one of the links between okay. Australia, Guam, LA breaks. Do we have the backup capacity with the traffic going to go? Um, and as Ed is saying, we're going to need to have all those things in place in order to be able to talk to our funding buddies about, all right, we need this extra money to get this extra capacity. And here's the demonstration that we have a system that has the basic capabilities, but in two years is going to lack 400 gig between Europe and, and North America. So please make those investments because otherwise those investments are not going to come because the people, universities or research councils who pay the bills are going to say, look, do you have any idea what you're buying? Are you just throwing money around to, to buy fancy new stuff because you think it's cool to have a terabit system? Um, so, so also for that, policy reason we, we are going to need to have those systems right so it's back to the to the map that that uh francis was talking about right we've been rambling for an hour um does anyone have comments questions uh contributions contributions ideas for future you know kenishi san had a great idea you know, we, we haven't committed um, really in any of these sessions to producing minutes. Um, I have a list of notes. I'm sure we all have you know, a preparation for this talk and we could put together, you know, a, a, a draft that kind of outlines the thinking uh, and distribute it as, as meetings, uh, as minutes from this discussion. I mean, I think we can commit to, to doing sure. that. Um, but but what else? What other comments? What other practical sort of takeaways do we need to address? Uh, is this line of thinking something that the community is behind, that, that your community is behind? Um, I mean, is this worth pursuing? Is this something, you know, we talked about um, it requiring dedicated resources to do this. Uh, is this something that you see value in? Uh, I'm hoping that um, because a number of the engineers are all here, um, I'm hoping that there's something we can do where we can come back next APM meeting and report on the outcome. Um, I'm I'm hoping it's not just a minute. Uh, I'm 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 looking at is there something that we can do very short term. Uh, may not be a very big thing, but something that we can do together, organize together with some of the NRANs here. You got uh, APAN JP down down here. You got Singaran down here. You got Brenda down there. Oh, sorry, Brenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, Arena Pack people are here as well. So if we can get a few of this operation things and 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 say let's do something together and maybe we come back and report on, on what we found out. Either positive or negative, it, 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 it's fine. It, it, it's, it, 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 we learn something. That, that's what's important. Yeah, Brenda. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is, are the procedural documents for each of these separate systems available to everyone? Can we find some place to put them all and find, and, and 
find pros and cons or some sort of culmination of what's similar and what's different. Um, I think that would be a good start to seeing what the differences are between these systems, what's already existing that's the same, um, and which system is potentially doing something better or different or uh, more effective.